Meet someone invisible. I'll do it. Uh, okay. Thanks, lunch lady. Hello, and welcome to episode 69 of Popcorn and Prosecco, a show that's all about talking about movies. I am Perry Nemiroff, and here are my co-hosts, Christy Fuchko and Angie Han. Hello! Hi! All right, so this week we are doing a mini review of Insidious Chapter 3, and then our big one is going to be for Spy. So we're going to start with Insidious, and that one is mine. Here's the synopsis. A prequel set before the haunting of the Lambert family that reveals how gifted psychic Elise Rayner reluctantly agrees to use her ability to contact the dead in order to help a teenage girl who has been targeted by a dangerous supernatural entity. Yet another accurate one. I approve. But I've been that's waiting a, on pins and needles to see what you're going to say about this one. That one was a bit of a mouthful, but it is right. But that doesn't mean I like the movie. And I, I didn't like this at all. And You were I, I'm so not sure sad, the, too. I, I knew that I was, like, visibly upset after. You did. You look like sh- yeah. you look shaken. I was, like, I was sad. I, I walked out of this movie really sad because I adore the first one where I have seen it, I mean, dozens and dozens of times, and I love it. And it's, I don't really own very many uh, DVDs and Blu-rays, but it's one of, like, 15 that sits on my shelf that I'll pop in whenever I just, like, need to have some fun. So what and, does the first one do for you that this one didn't? I mean, just, it's, it starts, I'm looking at the DVD right now. I should have, I should have put it like you do as uh, props. Um, the first one just feels very unique to me and it's got this really rich mythology that you're kind of exploring and you're introduced to through this very likable family that feels like a real family you can connect to and you feel for them when they're going through this and all of a sudden Elise steps in and she's got everything like down to a science. She's got this really like rich defined personality to her and this movie kind of takes that like all the way. I yeah. don't know if I I didn't hate the main girl, Quinn. I liked her and I liked the actress who played her. It's just that there wasn't really much to her. And Dermot Mulroney is in the running for like the worst movie dad I've ever seen in my I life. I think that I Dermot Mulroney him. doesn't watch horror movies and so thought that's how people in horror movies act. It's just so schmackty. He's just like, where's my daughter? Her, her. It's just like, it's it's so bad. And like the family, like you talked before about how the first Insidious gave us this family that you actually felt connected to. And we said the same thing about the Poltergeist remake where you felt connected to these people. Like Insidious chapter three, the family feels so incidental. There's a, there's a brother character that you could very well forget exists because he disappears for like a huge swath of the movie and then pops up just something and be like go to the neighbors like yeah it's not just the family either like there's a whole, she the movie introduces a whole bunch of neighbors and like friends that she has that, that are like all in the first act and then you just never hear about them again and it, and it just kind of feels like well, what was the point of that the second movie which Lee Wanell wrote as well has a very similar problem where it's about two very separate things happening and you know when you set up a movie like that you're going to care sometimes more about one than the other and it's just not going to come together like the best part about the first one was it was all about the family and then Elise helped that family last time it was about like the um, Barbara Hershey's character in the fucking hospital which made no sense and then back at home with boring the Lamberts who were experiencing nothing new and this time it's all the shit at home and then it's like Elise's personal problems with her husband who passed away that kind of makes like, it doesn't like, make a lot of sense. Even Here's the problem I have from. with the Elise story is that the movie sets it up as if it's the girl's story, but then it's actually Elise's story. So why are we focusing so much on the girl? But then Elise's story is not interesting because we've already seen the first two movies. So the fact that again and again, she's like, I can't use my powers, but I must use my powers, but I can't use my powers, but I must. Like, we know it's going to happen. So there's like no sense of tension there. And then worse yet, Lee Wanell just repeats the beats where she literally is saying the same <laughs> things over and over again and doing the same things over over and over again and it feels infuriating it doesn't enrich in this mythos that Perry was talking about it just makes it kind of cheap and it answers questions you never gave a shit about to begin with like hey why do specs and the fat guy wear some t- shirts and ties and I've never cared about that ever but this movie gives you an answer well, you were talking about how the movie repeats a lot of beats, and it's not just the character beats, uh, which don't land as hard as as hard as they should because he doesn't spend that much time fleshing out the characters, including Elise, sadly. Uh, but it's also the scares. The scares are also like in the in the beginning of the movie, I was like, oh, this is actually pretty creepy. You know, like you see the monster pretty quickly, and you're just like, oh, okay, that is really off putting. Like I, you, I was sitting next to you, Christy, and I like jumped the first time it came out. You did. It was adorable. But then it, they keep showing it in exactly the same way, doing exactly the same thing over and over and over to diminishing. 
returns and even the finale like i get you know where there's the big showdown as there is inevitably in these kinds of movies uh, well the problem really with that anything. too is it's only jump scares and then it's only look at the man who can't breathe isn't he scary and that's all it is this yeah, entire exactly. movie the one of well, the greatest also, things that the we, first one did is when we saw the the fireface demon, you didn't really get a good look at him until much further on in the movie. And it was mostly like people hiding in the shadows and kind of like popping up out of nowhere, but in conjunction with what was happening in a scene and in conjunction with the score, too. The score in that movie was absolutely brilliant. And you don't really get they that. They barely it's use like, music in And, like, the, the Insidious score is so iconic, where if I hear certain, like, tones and tunes, I know it's that movie. I would have thought they would have put it to better use here. And the, the fucking bride in black, what did they do to her in this movie? She looks like... She looks like someone who dressed up as her for Halloween. Yeah, it's really sloppy. And it's like Ugh. the gratuitous use of her, too. I mean, I feel like there's a huge difference. Like, James Wan left. He's not directing these movies anymore. They let Lee, Lee Wanell step in. And I think, one, the script is weak. But two, Lee Wanell has nowhere near the sense of vision that James Wan does. This movie does not look interesting. The shots are really ridiculous. The, the acting is bad. Like... This yeah, is just I, I feel all like there's around. an elegance to James Wan's earlier two films that this film just doesn't have. Everything is just kind of like, you know, like everything is staged really lazily. Like all the characters are drawn really lazily. Like, it feels like a rush job. And and one of the, and even, so, you know, it's kind of a haunted house thing. And I, I always had trouble keeping track of like, what is this house? Where is everyone? Like that was really well, confusing it to me. It kind of ruins what the further was. Like at least, I, I'll admit that the first movie feels a little disjointed when it gets to the third act and all of a sudden you're in this other world something does never worked quite well with that it's a bit too it's too much of a jump but at least that movie established what the further was and gave you like somewhat of a sense of the geography with how that yeah. universe works that's kind of all gone here that and it doesn't really make much sense it's kind of like one of those cheap tricks where someone gets knocked out and they wake up in a dream or an alternate reality you know yeah and that's so exactly to summarize this is. this is a mess would any of you recommend anybody going to see it no. yeah no yeah and skip it watch poltergeist instead yeah yeah I'm surprised. Agreed. I can't believe that I'm saying it, but like half, I think you two brought it up after we walked out too. A lot of times during this movie, I thought that I wish I could have seen Poltergeist instead. So it's we're going to move on to a movie that we thought way higher of. <laughs> Spy! Um, so Spy, a desk-bound CIA analyst, volunteers to go undercover to infiltrate the world of deadly arms dealer and, a pre and prevent a diabolical global disaster. Uh, so it's Melissa McCarthy, and she basically has been, like, really great behind the scenes, like, in the ear of a James Bond type played by Jude Law, and now she gets to actually step into the field. And it's a really fucking good movie, guys. Like, I was, I honestly have had a little bit of a problem since we saw Mad Max Fury Road, where everything I've seen past then has just... Like it's like it's like Mad Max blew out my palate and like I just can't taste anything anymore because Mad Max was so good everything else sucked. But by to the be time fair, the to... movies we've seen since Mad Max, I don't think they're movies you would have yeah. loved help. even if you Doesn't hadn't help. seen Mad Max. But what's cool about this movie is it starts off kind of with a cold open of like what she's good at behind the scenes, and then there's like a big surprise, and then by the time we get to the animated opening titles that are very like Bond with like wow 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 like spy stuff going on, like I was literally like in my seat like yeah like it was exciting and it was fun and Paul Feig we saw him do a little bit of action stuff in the heat but he steps it up with Spy and like I think the action scenes in this are great but on top of that man the comedy is on point I yeah, was laughing about from Jason Statham in this movie oh Jason yeah Statham! he basically pays like the Jason Statham type but like exaggerated to like you know comedic effect and it's perfect but he plays it straight. Like, he never winks yeah. at the camera. He says all this ridiculous stuff that he's done, which, like, I think some of it is honestly just stuff he's done in the Crank movies. But, like, he Probably. says this stuff where he's like, I saw my wife fall out of a plane and then get hit by another plane. And he says it so straight-faced that she's like, what are you talking? And, like, the play of them is brilliant. Like, halfway through the movie, I wrote in my notes during one of their scenes, like, I want a sequel now. If you've they seen have that really contest that chemistry. people are running with the face-off machine thing where you can own his face, it's not weird, I swear, once you see the movie. You see that movie and you're going to want his face. It's still kind of weird once you've seen the okay, movie. Okay, it's still a little weird, but the joke is really good. Yes. But the yeah, only... like, Melissa McCarthy is great in this, and, like, Perry wrote a really great piece about how, like, we don't just need her to be a dumb 
you know, dumb bunny to like be funny. She's really funny in this and she's good at her job. It's just that she's on the field for the first time. So it's a little fish out of water, but she's not clueless. And like watching her, what's also cool is the narrative makes it about everybody not really believing in her. So except for her best friend who we'll get to Miranda Hart mm. from uh, Call the Midwife. Awesome. But she, uh, it's about her like defying their expectations of her and like, you know, going for it. And so it's not just a really funny and a really exciting movie, but it's one that like I walked away feeling really good about. That's the best part about this kind of thing. And that's part of the reason that I wanted to write that piece, because with movies like especially Identity Thief and Tammy, they are so mean spirited, whether it's like degrading humor towards her where she has to put herself down in order to earn laughs or just like the fact that characters are so freaking mean to each other all throughout. And that's how they get their laughs. That's not really the case. I mean, characters are kind of like poking and prodding each other, but for example, the relationship between Melissa McCarthy's character and Jason Statham's character, it's almost like they're trying to one-up each other to be better at their job, not to yeah. be like, you piece of shit. No, you piece of shit. Exactly. The only, they definitely the undermine her. The only time her. that it got to me was when she's making fun of the other, her other uh, uh, security bold- guard. Oh, in the, the, oh. And towards the end of the film, where it's right. legit just her, you know, mouthing off. He's a bad guy, it. though. But and is he? Melissa McCarthy bar- is so good at like these. Know him. Melissa McCarthy is so good at doing those like long, vulgar insults that I was happy to see that. Yeah, and like Rose Byrne is in this, which I can't believe we didn't bring her up. Rose Byrne's so good in this. She has some of one-liners that are just I'm already throwing into my dialogue. So if I tell you that's the Bulgarian clown with you, and you deal with it. Um, but yeah, like the the script is just on. It's such good casting. Like it's such good casting that like on Even that 50 alone, Cent it is works really beautifully. good in this movie. Sorry. Even Fifty Cent is really good in this movie. Yeah, I don't want to get too much into what Fifty Cent does in this movie, but like I kind of forgot he was in it. Like I had heard that, and then like when you he didn't shows see up, all like, those ridiculous promos that they released. It was. It was like a series, and you, you know, when he's just standing up and like kind of promoting something, it, there's something inherently awkward about it. So I can't say they play too well, but he's very good in the movie, at least. Yeah, yeah and go- like, Sorry. there's just, I'm, I'm, I'm. I'm overwhelmed. I don't know what to talk about next because there's just so many things in this movie I like. Like for my spinoff review, I said it's. I think it's the best comedy of the year. I, I'm just really blown away by how funny I found this. Like at the end, I actually had that pain you get right here when you've been like smiling a lot, because like. It just, I, I was, like, telling my husband some of the jokes, which I won't do in the podcast because, like, I want you guys to be surprised. But it's, like, there's, like, silly little jokes, but then there's, like, really spy-specific jokes. And it just plays so nicely. And then there's fun things in there. There's, like, a cameo where her husband pops in and the director pops in. And um, so keep an eye out for those. It's, like, a game. It just feels, like, I don't know, almost interactive in the way it responds with the audience. I heard that some people thought that it was a little bit too long, but going back, first of all, I didn't feel like it was too long, but even going back, like, I can't think of a single scene that I would take out. Yeah, I've heard some people say it's too long. One, it's a Paul Feig movie, and, like, Feig, like Apatow, tends to make his movies a little longer than comedies tend to be, and I think this one is two hours. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's exactly two hours. Um, yeah, I, I I, mean, like, when people are like, what about this scene or what about this scene? I was like, I guess. But, like, I was never bored, so I don't really care that it's – I feel like it's just that we're, we're, we've come accustomed to expecting a 90-minute comedy. And because it's two hours, people are like, well, it better damn well be worth it. But it's like we get chase scenes. We get action scenes. We get, like, heartfelt moments. I was totally fine with it being two hours. I don't want to lose anything. I mean, this is the third film that Paul Feig and Melissa McCarthy have done well together, and I think he really brings out the best in her. Going back to, you know, go, to rewind a bit, you know, you guys were talking about Perry's essay and how she was pointing out that this is a movie where Melissa McCarthy gets to be competent, and I really love the way this movie plays with our perceptions of her, because let's be real, one of the reasons that she always gets pigeonholed as, like, the sloppy, mean, dumb person is because of the way she looks. And this movie is also, in some ways, about the way she looks, but it plays with that really effectively. Like, for example, the... the the reason she gets chosen to be the spy and the reason that she takes on the specific disguises that she does is because it's it becomes obvious that someone who looks like Melissa McCarthy, especially if you like kind of frump her down in like sweatshirts and like tacky hair, is essentially invisible. So I thought that was I thought that was just like a really fun way to spin a, a fun spin on the spy genre where usually you get these spies that are you know you have like James Bond who like a guy like that is walking down the street everyone's gonna notice even if he's not a spy. I'm not saying exactly. that you know part of it is wishful fulfillment so it's fun, but I really appreciated the way that Spy played with that. 
it, it reminded me a lot of the stuff from Amy Schumer where she has a sketch on her show this I think it was this season where she plays plain Jane who's like an undercover cop that's just normal looking and so she goes into all these clubs and like literally no one sees her because she's just not hot and like it just reminded me of that where it's like they all think that way of her and like they, and also there's a commentary on the way Hollywood looks at women who are who are heavier frankly because the parts they keep giving her as Angie pointed out it's like okay you're a divorced housewife who has five cats or something and she's like what like come on and like they keep giving her these stereotypically sad archetypes and she's like but that's not who I am like that's and they're like no 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 that's people will believe that and I think that's speaking to Hollywood and saying like Hollywood wants to you know act like we we don't trust that people who are you know super glitzy glamorous can do anything else and like she keeps defying that and it's really funny and lovely and like yeah I think it, I think this movie I was cr- talking to Chrissy about this after the movie but I think it's a movie that actually really makes a strong case for casting for more diverse casting in movies because it's really easy to imagine a version of this movie you know a spy parody basically with like just another you know moderately attractive white dude in it but the fact that the lead character in this is a woman and not only a woman but the kind of woman that Hollywood doesn't traditionally want at the center of their big movies makes it so much more interesting, allows you to tell a different kind of story, makes it feel fresh, and makes it feel really different from every other movie we've seen in a similar vein over the past, like, however many years. Exactly. Well, She's not a James Bond. Susan Cooper is her own thing. movie to heart and stick with that kind of stuff because if yeah. she goes back to Tammy and Identity Thief shit after this, I'm going to Well, we need to remember that she did, I think she co-wrote Tammy. She like, co-wrote, Tammy. She co-wrote Tammy, which and is, I like, get what the they most were trying shocking to do thing with in the Tammy. world to me. But it's it's hard. Identity I, Thief I have a harder time with. But, like, yeah, it's – the thing – I don't mind, like, you know, because, like, comedy greats like John Candy, uh, you know, he played dumb a lot of the time. And I don't have a problem with, with her playing dumb. But it's exciting to get to see her do something beyond that because, you know, like, she's a lot of fun as just a, a hero kind of – in over their head but, like, raring to go. And, like, you know, it made this spy movie a lot – I didn't know what to expect, basically, because I was like, I've never seen a spy movie about a character like Susan. And it made it genuinely, like, thrilling because it, it was like, well, you know, I mean, and not on the level of like, will she die or not? She's like, it's fucking comedy. Like, let's not get crazy. But like, I didn't know what her next move was going to be because it's like with Bond, he's going to be like, here's my handy gadget, blah, blah, blah. And like, you know, there's there's just a certain predictability to those movies. But with this, they did something much more interesting. And then they also bring in the Miranda Hart character that, as we mentioned, um, was, you know, it's her friend. They, they bring her back in and then it gets to be a story not just about Susan Cooper, but about her friend too, where it's about like women working together and also with Rose Byrne, women tearing each other down. Mm-hmm. But let's go into spoilers because guys, it's time to go into spoilers. I don't know. I don't okay. Know. Let's just do spoilers. Spoilers. And going off of what you just said, Miranda Hart gets the best payoff in the entire movie. It's like, I couldn't smile wide enough when she got her big moment in the end. And it's like, I've enjoyed her from Call the Midwife, which is a show I realize not everyone's been watching. But like in Call the Midwife, she is a woman who is so much larger than everyone else and is constantly kind of called out for being different. And she gets like little victories in that show, but it's like a British drama. So like little victories in that show are little victories. And apparently this part was written for her, which I was like, obviously, because it's her getting to be loud and funny and wonderful and all the things that like you got kernels of in that show. Um yeah, I, I really hope this means she's going to get cast in a lot more things because, you know, Paul Feig is really good about being like, here's some amazing talent for you. Yeah, I mean, so wonderful. Being a prime and I think example. Her, her part also points out something that makes Spy different from the large majority of Melissa McCarthy's movies, which is like a warmth she brings to it. Like, even though she's always kind of going back and forth with Melissa McCarthy with one-liners that are very funny, there's something about her character that kind of feels safe to me it's like i'm okay i'm okay with susan doing all these crazy things because like she's got someone looking out for her that really cares about her well to me it reminded me of like there's like a part where they're having cocktails and talking shit on someone and like i was like uh i was like it reminded me of like when we go out and we get there's a safe space where we can have these conversations and whatever and and then be supportive of each other all the time yeah that's right guys (laughs) just know that it's all i got that's all I got. Um, no, but I, I, I thought it was really lovely because, like, we've talked before about how Hollywood seems to think 
male friendship is a topic not worth getting into in movies, but thank God, like, Paul Feig gets it and gets that it's a rich place to, like, mine jokes and mine drama. And, you know, I think Spy, uh, it's being held up as, like, this great thing from Melissa McCarthy, and it is. She dominates this movie. She's amazing. Jason Statham is great in this movie, and people are like, oh, right, he's done comedy. But, like, I also feel like it's a really strong narrative about female friendship and, and the importance of that and, you know, the fucking kick assness of it. These women are spies. The the fight scene in the kitchen is one of the best fight sequences I've seen in a very long time. It yeah. is so clever because there's so many, there's so much like legit hand-to-hand combat where you know these two ladies have trained seriously, but then there's also like like hints of goofiness too where she's they're like hitting each other with pots and pans. It's like the perfect balance of funny and outlandish but like serious combat too and that they put it in a kitchen i feel like is a thing specifically for haters like oh you want women in the kitchen bam <laughs> with butcher knives and like that fight scene had me nervous because the girl playing the one in the jumpsuit i don't remember her name in the movie but you've seen the picture she's wearing like a green jumpsuit and she looks fantastic and she's just like wow 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 and i was like i would be terrified of her <laughs> and then like the oh god she gets stabbed in the hand and she's just like whatever you know what else I loved and I couldn't get enough of? The the rats and the bats in the building. Of course. It's like the, the greatest thing because it's something that is like, holy shit, I can't believe this is happening now. And then they don't let it go, but not in a way where it repeats something until like you're sick of it. It's just like, you need to look out for it. Like they're there. They're yeah. all, and every time I'd catch one out of the corner of my eye, I'd start laughing. And like, sometimes the people next to me didn't see it. And I was just sitting no, there I know. There's like, like one scene where Miranda Hart has one on her shoulder. Yeah. And she's not reacting to it at all. And I just started to giggle like a moron <laughs> because she's just doing her lines. But there's, <laughs> but anyway, we should wrap up. So I think, this week we're telling you Insidious Chapter 3 is a skip, but guys, Spy is the bomb. Yeah, I freaking love this movie. I have seen it twice now. I loved it after South By, and like because of the festival vibe, I was afraid I got too hyped about it. I don't think I got hyped enough, though, because I saw it again. I'm obsessed with it. I can't wait to own this so I can watch it over and over again, because it's something that you're going to want to see multiple times. And watch Yeah, I'm sure I missed jokes. TV. I was laughing through parts so hard. I'm like, I don't know what just happened. Yeah, I second that, or third that, I guess. All right, so that is a wrap on episode 69. <laughs> you know, like Billy Madison? We almost <laughs> made it through without our juvenile 69 joke. <laughs> Every <sighs> time I hear 69, though, I hear him doing that in the third grade class when they open the book. Whatever, 69. Episode 69 is over. Because clearly I've had enough. Um, so you can catch us all over the place on iTunes, where it would be very nice if you can rate and comment. And then we are on YouTube. We have our own YouTube channel, popcornprosecco.com. Like us on Facebook, and you can also talk to us on Twitter at Popcorn Prosecco. The three of us are all over the internet as well. Christy, you want to go first? Yeah, I write all over the web. So you can check out my career highlights at decadentcriminals.com. I have a really fun interview with Kit Harrington on screen rant this week um he was lovely and you can find me on twitter at christy Puchko. angie you can find me on twitter at ajhan and you can find my writing on slash film.com i'm still giggling about my 69 joke because i'm a baby <laughs> and... i feel like this makes spy seem less impressive people are gonna be like i mean she laughs at the word 69 how hard can it be to make her giggle you were laughing at least as hard as you did at spy <laughs> yeah i'd say so doesn't this make you want to follow me on Twitter at PNemeroff and then read my writing on Collider.com? All right, that's it for this episode. Thank you guys for watching, and we will see you next week. I just hear my mom's voice. Just blend in. Let somebody else win. Making a wave isn't always brave. Brilliant. Give up on your dreams, Susan. Just to write that in my lunchbox. Spy you later. I don't think that's a thing. Spy you later isn't a... Is it? No, it's not a thing.